All right, all right. As everyone is getting in and getting settled, I want to welcome you all to a live, another live podcast recording in HBHQ inside our Hello Betty headquarters. We have two back to back, so it's a big treat for you guys this month. This uh, episode, I'm really excited about. We are going to do a, it's going to be an interactive uh, hands-on training today, and we are going to be talking all about money mindset and how we can, and whether or not you are interested in breaking through uh, limiting beliefs that you may have around money and wealth creation, or you can use this as a personal development tool, because I think that some of the principles that we're going to talk about tonight are going to apply to not only your money mindset, of course, but in all aspects of personal development, how we look at change, what are some of our core wounds, what are some of our desires. We're going to get into all of that with my guest today, which is Emily Williams. She's the one in the pink, can't miss her, blonde hair, pink outfit. Uh, Emily is a money mindset expert. She's a success coach, an author, and a speaker, and she is the CEO of both her lifestyle and media company called I Heart My Life and her personal brand, where she helps executives and entrepreneurs break through their limiting beliefs, rewrite their money stories so that they can increase both their income and their impact. Two eyes I really like, income and impact. And those are always related to each other, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. So um, her whole uh, really uh, through line is to help people feel more fulfilled and satisfied than they were before. So Emily, welcome to the show. I'm so Happy that uh, my partner, Giovanni, uh, made the introduction to you. And you're one of the only sort of female mindset, money mindset coaches. I don't, there's not a lot of, there's not, you are like very much by yourself in that niche. I like that. I like being special and I love this topic. So I'm pumped to be here and serve your community. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Th and thank you for accepting uh, the invitation. So we are going to, I know we were talking in the pre-chat, you wanted to do an interactive training with our Bettys, which I think is going to be such a treat for them. And so we'll do the training. And then I know that there's going to be questions that both my Bettys are going to have that I'm going to have. So we'll have sort of a blended uh, Q and a, I'm going to lead it. And I'll also, um, help facilitate questions from my community as well that you can help answer too. So I'll let you, I'll let you take it away. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. So before we kick it off, kick off the training, I want to know if everyone has heard the phrase money mindset. So type in the chat box. If you've heard money mindset, if you know, you have a money story, if you know what limiting beliefs around money actually are, I just want to get a pulse for the community. And then we're going to dive in. So I have some yeses. Great. Betty McCormick says, has not heard of money mindset. Okay. Awesome. Amazing. So some yeses and some noes. Okay. Now, first and foremost, I want to share a little bit about my backstory because I want you to feel like you understand why I'm actually qualified to teach this in the first place. I think that's really important. And we all know that we learn from other people's experiences and stories. So for me, my story starts back in 2008. And don't worry, I'm not going to go throughout every single year, but it starts back in 2008 when I had accepted an opportunity at Northwestern University to get a counseling psychology degree. And I was literally driving there from Ohio to Chicago to find an apartment in the city. And I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach, like it wasn't the right next fit for me, the next step. And my mom was driving the car. I was in the passenger seat and I started to cry and I was trying to hide my tears, but she could see that there was something that was coming up for me. So she asked me what was wrong. And I said, I don't think I can do this. And literally in that moment, we turned the car around and went back to Ohio. And I entered into a full blown quarter life crisis where I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I ended up working at Starbucks for a bit. I worked at a hospital. I did a bunch of random things. I moved back in with my parents and I just felt like a complete failure. 
And around that same time, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, I started to get this feeling like I was meant to move to England. And that might sound really random and it was really random, but I kept feeling like there was another place for me and that I wanted to just explore what that meant. So long story short, I actually moved to the UK in 2010. I started in a master's in nonfiction writing program because I wanted to write a book. That was the most clarity that I had in that moment. Started writing this book and just started a new life there. And I thought my quarter life crisis would shift once I was in the UK, but it didn't. I was still lost. I was still confused. I had no friends. I ended up throwing myself into the world of online dating where I ended up meeting my husband, which was amazing, but I still couldn't uncover what my purpose actually was. Fast forward to 2013, I discovered the world of coaching. Um, and it was one of those cheesy light bulb moments, but I knew that that was the right next step for me. Everything started to come together. Now, the only thing I didn't know was how to make money and how to start an online business. So I started to look at all the free courses online, all the webinars, all the things I could get my hands on to try and piece together how to start this, this life coaching business. And around that time, I came up with the idea of I Heart My Life, which is essentially it. it says it in the title, helping you love your life. I heart my life. And it was designed to be a life coaching company for women. Now, luckily I had a very supportive husband and he actually lent me his credit card to sign up for the first program I was a part of because I was $30,000 in credit card debt and 90,000 in student loan debt. So I did not have any money. I was well below zero when I started my business. My husband was making about $30,000 a year. So he didn't have a lot of money, but he lent me his card because he believed in me. So I kicked off my business and in July, 2014, I made a whopping $442. Now these are important numbers because we're going to get into the details here. And around that time, again, I had major money goals, but I wasn't making a lot of money. Then a few months later, when I was a part of a program that was designed to help me make money, I went through this period of 54 no's in a row. And what that means is I got on 54 sales calls and everyone said they did not want to work with me. And so I realized I had a sales problem. I realized I had a money problem and I knew that I was meant for big things. I knew that this coaching business could take off, but I didn't know how to make it happen. So luckily, like I said, I was a part of a program and the coach that I worked with, she was actually a money mindset expert. So we started to go deeper with what was going on with me. Why wasn't I converting these sales calls? Why weren't people signing up to work with me? And it wasn't a strategy issue because obviously I was booking a lot of calls, but there was something else going on beneath the surface that I didn't know about. And that was my money mindset and my money stories. So once I started working with that coach, everything started to shift. And I actually went from $442 all the way up to seven figures in my first 18 months in business. And I share that with you today because I want you to understand what is possible when you do this work, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're in a career, it doesn't matter. There is wealth available for all of us if we do the internal work and we bust through all of the stuff that's holding us back. It's not about another strategy. It's about you getting clear on what it is you actually want and then removing all the fears and the blocks that are stopping you from get it, getting it. And that's what today is about. So is anyone curious to know about this topic? Does that sound good to know how to create wealth in your life? And you can do it quickly. As I just described in my story, speed was a part of my story. And I'm not saying that's how everyone else, um, you know, how, what their process looks like, but it is possible for you. Okay. So we're going to talk about that today. So, um, great. Emily just graduated her coaching program and she wants to start a business. Amazing. Love it. Okay. So here's, what we're going to cover today. You're going to get clue clear on your true desires and your financial goals. You're going to find out if you're wired for under earning or blocking money. And if so, that will change on this training. You're going to identify the money beliefs that are keeping you broke or financially stuck. You're going to get the tools to transform your money mindset and create abundance. Now you're going to learn why it's essential for you to be rich. You're going to learn the number one thing that will help you generate more sales. Now, I know at this part of the training, a lot of people actually start to get a little bit uncomfortable about me talking about money and getting rich specifically. So if that's you, just allow yourself to observe that experience and we'll come to that in just a little bit, but just know that that's normal if that's what you're feeling. Okay.
So before we go any further, I want to explain what money mindset actually is. So money mindset is basically our belief about money that's been passed down from previous generations. So maybe that's your parents. It could be your grandparents. It could be ancestors you don't even know because all these limiting beliefs, they're a part of us. It's like our DNA, right? And it's instilled in us from a very early age. So we grow up learning about money and then we bring that into our adulthood. And most likely it doesn't serve us because it's all these ancient beliefs that are holding us hostage from our dreams. And that's essentially what was happening for me. I didn't know how to sell. And so because I had all these thoughts about sales being wrong and these fears about not wanting to be too salesy or too pushy, I was limiting myself. So I had to bust through all of that in order to go to the next level. Okay. So basically your mind is like a computer. It has an operating system. So we want to give you that upgrade. That's going to help you get the upgraded life. That's the easiest way to think about it. We all install the new operating systems on our phones, on our computers all the time. This is what we're doing for you in terms of your mindset. The truth is the mind is lazy. It does not want to have to think of new concepts or new ways of doing things or new ways of showing up in the world. So it's going to pull from either your parents' previous previous experiences, your previous experiences, and then it's going to say, okay, you know what? Don't start the business or don't invest in the coach or don't fly first class because it already has all these rules set in stone and it doesn't want to deviate from that. So today we want to become aware of the rules and the programming that's happening beneath the surface that's keeping you from everything you want, okay? So it's really like recreating this foundation. If you wanna build a new house or you wanna start a business, you're gonna lay the foundation first. And yet most people don't do this work. I look at a lot of our clients who have huge breakthroughs and they're doing work that most people never do in a lifetime. So that's why I'm so excited that all of you are here and that you chose to show up because this is going to be pivotal to the success that you want to create and helping you create a life that's better than your dreams. Okay. So in the book, How Rich People Think by Steve Seibold, he says, your current financial status will give you an idea of your past thinking. So if you don't like the number in your bank account, that tells me that there's some issues with your thinking. Okay. Now I want you to understand that your current financial status, it's not an indication of what's possible for you. Just like I shared in my story, if I had thought that that $442 a month was all that was possible for me, then I never would have put myself out there. I never would have started my business. I never would have tried for the next level. And so if that's where you're at today, please eradicate that thinking and just know that where you are right now, it's literally just where you are right now. It doesn't mean anything about what's possible for you. The thing that does mean everything about what's possible for you are your desires. Okay. Now I am so passionate about the word desire. And for me, it's so much stronger than a want or a craving. It's really, it's just something that's instilled in us. And there's uh, an amazing quote by this author named Raymond Hollywell that I'm going to read to you. And it literally is word for word, the best thing ever. Every sentence is so powerful. So I want you to take notes and listen up. So Raymond Hollywell is describing desire and he says, true desire represents the urge of life seeking a fuller expression and is kept alive by the continuous expectation of its fulfillment. It brings to us weight, new ways and means for its manifestations. The principle explains, now this is important. The principle explains that no desire is felt until the supply is ready to appear. No mind can be conscious of a need or a desire unless the possibility of its fulfillment already exists. Now I'm going to back up and read that again, this last part. No mind can be conscious of a need or a desire unless the possibility of its fulfillment already exists. I share that with you today because so often we have these desires and they could be big money goals. It could be the goal of buying a house or building a house or having a new wardrobe or having a full-time nanny or hiring the coach, whatever it is, we have these desires and yet we make ourselves wrong for them. We make ourselves guilty over them. We feel bad spending the money. We feel like we're being too greedy. We shouldn't want any more. We shouldn't want too much. We shouldn't put ourselves out there. We shouldn't book the first class ticket because it's a waste of money. It's an indulgence. It's greed. We have all these stories. And so we're denying our desires on a regular basis. And guess what? 
If you're denying something, then you're most likely not going to get it. If you feel bad about something, you're going to keep yourself from it. If you judge something, you're going to block it because the subconscious does not want you to have something that you're judging because it doesn't want you to be in judgment of yourself. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And when I got that, that was so huge. And I realized I had so many things going on beneath the surface. I had a fear of making too much money and not being loved by my family and friends. I had a fear of people thinking that I was too greedy. I had a fear of being too salesy on all of these calls. And yet I wanted to make a ton of money, right? So there was a disconnect. So my belief is that if you really wanted something, you would have it already. And a lot of people hate when I say that, and I'm going to explain it a little bit more, but the way that I look at it is everything that you want is available and meant for you. So if you don't have it yet, there's something stopping you from getting it. And for most people, it starts with this desire piece because they think they want it, but then there's a fear of success. There's a fear of making too much money because, oh, you know what? It's going to be too stressful. Or what will people think? Or I've even had people tell me the more money I make, the more I'm going to be expected to pay for, you know, what if I go out to dinner and then everyone wants me to pay for their meal, right? We have these fears on a regular basis. And so we're actually more attached to the fears than to the desires. And yet we say every single day, I want this thing. I want the car. I want to make more money. I want more clients. I've even had clients say to me, you know, I want more clients. And the next breath, they're like, I'm too busy. My calendar is too full. I don't want to take on more clients. So we need to get in alignment with our desires before anything will happen. And I love the fact that this quote talks about how desire is literally just the calling for more life. How can you fault yourself for something that is about more life? It's about you living your fullest life, your best life. And that's what money allows us to do. It provides that freedom. Money itself is not the goal. It's the thing that money buys. So when I first started out and I realized I had all these blocks, one of the first things I did was make a huge list of all my desires, literally everything I could possibly think of. It was things from being able to get a massage every single week to buying multiple properties around the world, to getting a Range Rover, to buying my parents a house, like all the things I could think of. And this is still a practice I do on a regular basis, because like I said, so often we are disconnected from our desires or we're in denial when it comes to our desires, okay? But the cool thing is, is you don't even have to question what you want. Because you're aware of it, that means you're already in vibrational harmony with the desire. Okay. I hope everyone is getting this because it's so, so important. And when I realized that I was like, okay, well, if I desire it, that means it's meant for me. That means it's possible. And that removed so many of the doubts and fears that often got in the way. So when you feel called to do something like make more money, that means you also have the potential to do it. Now we just need to figure out what could possibly hold us back and stop us from moving forward. Okay. Before we go into that, I want you to get clear on what your desires actually are because desires are a compass for your life. So does anyone have, um, I want some, some brave people here, put some of your biggest desires in the chat box. I listed off some of mine, truly the sky is the limit. You could tell me you want to create a trillion dollar company and I would love it. Okay. So there's no limit to desires. Okay. So Ashley says, I really like that line. If you want to make more money, that means you have the potential. Totally. So what are your biggest desires? What do you crave? What's on your list? I want to hear a couple. And if you don't know how to figure that out, I'm going to give you a few tips in just a second, because it's amazing to me how many of us are disconnected from our desires. Okay. We have someone saying, I want to be able to buy a house for my mom. Love it. Uh, Someone says, I want to have my LOC gone. Great. So we're going to keep generating these as I go along. Okay. Now, for those of you who are thinking, I don't know how to come up with my desires. I don't know how to get specific. There's a few things I want you to focus on. Now, I learned this from one of my incredible coaches. Gio knows him very well, David Nagel. There's this exercise around what you're tolerating. Now, this is something I did when I started to work with David. I had a list of 63 things, literally 63 things that I was tolerating. And that actually helped me get even clearer on what my desires were. Okay. So think about it for yourself. What are you tolerating? Are you tolerating not having enough money every month? Are you tolerating paying your bills late every single month? 
Are you tolerating not having the team that you desire? Are you tolerating not being able to afford the nanny or the personal trainer or the food from Whole Foods? Are you tolerating ordering the cheapest thing on the menu? Right? All these things are a reality for a lot of people. They're kind of standard practice, but you want to be extraordinary. And I know that because you're in Dr. Stephanie's group. And so we have to show up in an extraordinary way. That means getting clear on all the stuff that's holding us back, all the stuff that we don't want, because we are no longer going to tolerate a life that doesn't light us up. All right. Betty says she's tolerating uh, neighbors. That's huge. Right. So maybe it's time to move. That's a great awareness. Maybe your desire is to live somewhere else away from these crazy people. Okay. Teresa says, I want to spend money on myself without the guilt. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, this is so, so powerful. So that's what you're going to do after this training. You're going to get clear around what your desires actually are and what are you tolerating. Another good indicator of what you want is paying attention to your jealousy. So I remember back in the day when I first started my business, I was jealous of everyone. When I discovered coaching, um, I looked at all these amazing coaches online and I was jealous of everything that they were doing. But what I ultimately realized was that was a really good indication of what it was that I wanted. So I started to use my jealousy for good. I saw it as a superpower. It was like, okay, this is giving me clarity. Now I'm going to go and make that happen. Because when you see someone out there doing what you want to do, that's just a reminder that it's possible for you. Because they're a human having a human experience and you can do the same thing. So as you're scrolling through Instagram, as you're reading posts in this group, look and see who you're jealous of. Are you jealous of the person who went to Italy? Are you jealous of the person who started a business or somebody making a certain amount of money? Right? So this is really, really powerful when you flip the switch on what jealousy actually is. Because a lot of us have been told that it's wrong to feel jealous. And I think as women, I think as women too, just to interrupt you, I think that we're also just societally, we almost are pitted against each other in a way as well. And we always look at like, I can't be jealous. I can't, like, I got to throw it down. I got to throw it down. So I actually love this reframe that you're like, what this is a, this is a, it's like a North star. Like if you're jealous of someone, it's probably because you admire them in some way. There's an admiration component to it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And it's a great shift when we feel so bad about our jealousy, that's draining. That's just leaking energy and we're making ourselves wrong for it. If you can use it and, sh- and shift it into admiration and use it as that North star, that's a game changer. And then you can take it one step further, send that person a message, say, thank you for inspiring me. Thank you for showing me what's possible. Oh, that trip looked awesome. Because if you're in judgment of somebody again, That's not where we want to go. We want to go to admiration. We want to go to, oh, great. This is possible for me too. Okay. So like I said, there's a reason why I start this training with desire. It's because you have to be willing to really go there, to admit what it is that you require to be your best self, to serve at a higher level, to live your greatest life. And maybe that's a team. If you're running a company, maybe it's flying first class. Maybe it's a month off. Maybe it's that trip to Italy. Like somebody said in the chat box, maybe it's moving, but it's also really important to know this because I found that money needs a purpose. Now, let me give you an example of this. Every single day, I've been doing a money meditation lately because I'm looking to hit my next level financial goal. And what I realized the other day was the goal felt too far away, almost outside of me. And what I needed to do was get clear on what the money was actually for. Now, you can make money just to make money, but if you're looking to go to the next level, it often helps kind of ground you to know what the purpose is for. And that's why that desire list is so important. So what I did in the very beginning was I actually itemized everything on that list so I knew how much it would cost. And I do the same thing today. Okay. So we're in the midst of buying a house, we're building it. So I know how much that costs. That was something that was on my list years ago to manifest, right? So all the things that you want to create that are part of the next level version of you or of your business, you can write all of that down and get really clear. And then it helps your body and your mind accept that new reality because you can start to see, okay, so it would take this amount of money for me to pay for the team member. It would take this amount of money for me to go to Italy. It would take this amount of money for me to stay in that hotel or to fly first class. And that requires you getting really intimate with your finances, which is something a lot of people hate hearing me say, trust me, it was, uh, that was my story as well. I would look at my bank account kind of like this, like it was a scary movie with my eye, my, my hands in front of my eyes. 
but you have to get intimate with your finances and develop a new relationship with money just like any other relationship in your life. If, you know, Stephanie, if you weren't paying attention to Gio or if you always thought negatively about him, that wouldn't be a very healthy, loving relationship. It wouldn't be very fun. And it's the same thing with money. We have to develop that new relationship in order to heal and be able to uh, attract more of it, okay? So just get clear on what the purpose for the money is, write your list. And this mean, might mean doing some research. So maybe you actually have to look up the hotel you want to stay in in Italy. Go figure. You wouldn't believe how many people stop. They stop themselves from even taking that step because they're like, oh, you know what? It's too far off. It's not going to happen. It's not possible for me. Well, if you're not even allowing yourself to entertain the idea of going to Italy, it's definitely not going to happen. And I know there's so many people with a fear of it not happening, a fear of disappointment but that's not going to get you anything. We want to focus on the desire and the belief, developing the belief that you can have anything that you desire. It's right there. It's available for you. And when you own that and you own what it is that you want, your mind is creative. Your mind opens up and is actually able to see, okay, well, if I take this step, then I can start the business. If I take this step, then I'll close more sales calls. So that's what happened with me when I had that 50, that period of 54 no's in a row, I realized that the reason that was happening was because I had a fear of being too salesy and too pushy. So what I did is I transformed my process and I actually asked people if they wanted me to help them find the money. Now that came up because the, the excuse I heard time and time again was I'd love to work with you, but I don't have the money. So I decided to ask them, can I help you find the money? And no one's going to say no to that. Everyone wants support in that area. Everyone wants to know how to get to the next level. So we got to actually have open conversations about whether they could borrow the money from a family member. They could have a business loan. They could use a credit card. They could sell something. They could stop spending so much money at Starbucks and focus on building their business. So I got to be creative with them and actually support them. And I realized it was my duty to actually take it to the next level and to ask the question and to support them and to hold the faith that they did have the money because they didn't have many people in their lives doing that. Maybe that's your story as well. Maybe everyone in your life has a negative story about money. Maybe people think you're crazy for being in this group or wanting to better yourself or transform your body or transform your life. It's so amazing that you have this community of like-minded people who are there to hold you accountable and to support you and cheer you on, right? And so I had to shift that belief around being salesy and I shifted it into service and recognize that sales is actually service. Sales is love. And it was my duty to be there every step of the way and to not buy into anyone's money story because I had my own journey where I was $90,000 in student loan debt, $30,000 in credit card debt. And I still created a seven figure business in my first 18 months. So there's no excuse that anyone can share with me that I will buy. And I actually adopted this little methodology. I call it my rich grandma method, where I go into every call believing that everyone has a rich grandma in their corner who can fund their dreams. And of course, rich grandma is just a metaphor. Some people have a business loan. Some people have an investor, whatever it is. But I believe that anything is possible. And if the desire is there, the money is there. Okay. Now, I want to help you uncover some of your money blocks because we all have them regardless of where you're at. I still have stuff I'm working on. I'm sure Dr. Stephanie has stuff she's working on. It's always there, okay? Especially when you're going to the next level. Now, like I said, a lot of people don't know what these actually are, but we can look back in our past and look at how our parents were showing up and what they taught us about money in order to identify what those blocks are. And if you're one of those people who got a bit queasy or a bit nervous, as I started talking about you getting rich, it could just be because money wasn't actually spoken about in your household. So that tells us something in itself. If it was taboo to talk about money, that's an issue. How are we supposed to be good at making money if we can't even talk about it? Again, just like all the stuff you learn in this amazing membership, how are you supposed to be good at your relationship with food if you don't want to talk about it? How are you supposed to be good at sexuality if you don't even want to talk about it? So I want to read a list of some of the money stories that are really common amongst my community and see if you identify with any of them. So you can put yes in the chat box. So things like I'm bad with money. I can't save. 
I never have enough. I can't make enough. I feel guilty and ashamed for my debt. Making money means that I'm taking it from somebody. In order to make money, you have to work really, really hard because success is super hard to achieve. If I'm helping people, I can't charge a lot. It's wrong to talk about money. God doesn't want me to be wealthy. If I raise my prices, people won't buy my services. It's wrong to go into debt. I'm a terrible person because of my student loans. <laughs> and I could go on and on and on, but I'm seeing lots of yeses in the chat box. So I'm going to stop there. So how many people resonated with more than one? People are raising their hands. Yeah. Okay, great. So now we have an awareness, but I want you to really think about how much time you spend in that place. I know for me, the big one on this list, at least when I first started my business was I was so ashamed for my debt. It was like this heaviness every single day. I felt like it was going to take me forever to pay it off. I felt so guilty for the way that I'd spent. And that fed into me feeling like I was bad with money. If you're bringing that relationship and that thought process into your business, you can imagine that that's pretty much a recipe for disaster. Why would more money come to you if you feel like you're bad and you don't know how to manage it? So that was one of the first things that I had to heal. And one of the things that I did on a regular basis was I reprogrammed my mind. Now, this is simpler than it sounds. I literally every single day would journal new ways of thinking about money. That's one of the things that I did. And so what I would do is I would say, I'm paying off my debt. I am making more and more money every day. I always have enough money for all of my desires. And I would write these phrases over and over and over in my journal. I also had little post-it notes around my house. I had alarms on my phone. I still do this to, to, the, to this day. So right now, like I said, I'm looking to reach my next level money goals. So I have a little phrase on my phone that basically says that I've already hit that goal. And I write it in present tense because it's happening right now. So I want you to think about your top money block at the moment. Maybe it's that there's never enough money doesn't grow on trees. You have to work really hard. You have to be stressed in order to make a lot of money. Think about what your top money block is that, you know, is harming you and not helping you reach your desires. And I want you to write it down. Okay. You can also put it in the chat box if you want. And then what we do after we have that phrase is we literally flip the switch. So we make it the opposite. So again, maybe your belief is I don't have enough or there's never enough. Your new phrase could be, I always have enough money for all my desires. Okay. Sophia says the phrase working for me is galore, galore. I have all that I need and more. That's amazing. I love that. Thank you for sharing. So good. Yeah. And it should bring joy to your life, right? I always have enough money for all my desires. I'm rich. Sophia's amazing phrase. It should make you smile and it should feel good. Now, the thing that happens for a lot of people is they do this work and they manifest and they do the meditations and all of that, and yet they don't take the action. So I want you to understand that this is only one part of the process. This is only one piece of the puzzle. You have to start taking action on behalf of your desires. So you're retraining your mind. You're thinking these new thoughts. You're putting yourself into the position to become a different person, to reprogram your mindset. Maybe you're listening to meditations. Maybe you're listening to money mantras. Maybe you're reading books. But I want you to think about one big desire that you have. And you guys listed them in the chat box. What would it look like to actually take action towards that desire? Literally today. Now, this is where a lot of people get tripped up because they're like, you know what? I have these big dreams, but the big dreams are so far off in the future that of course it's easy to have the big dreams because it means that you're not actually taking action towards the big dreams anytime soon. And that's not what we want. I want you to start living as if you already have everything on that desire list. Now, that doesn't mean that you're spending money like a billionaire, but it does mean you're taking some action towards that list. So for me, that looked like things like buying myself flowers on a regular basis, because that was on my list, starting to shop at Whole Foods, taking a taxi instead of, I lived in London, London at the time, instead of taking uh, the underground, the tube, because it was cheaper right? So little things like that. Then it got to be a little bit bigger. I invested in myself. I started working with coaches. I made six figures in my business within, within six months. And around that same time, I was invited to be a part of a program that was designed to help me go to the million dollar mark. Now that program was $120,000. And I said, yes. 
And on paper, that was a crazy decision, but I knew I needed to start making decisions based on where I wanted to be, not from where I currently was. And so many of us are making decisions right now that are keeping us in this loop, this scarcity loop, this broke loop, and we're not actually getting out of it, right? And that's because we're doing more of the same. So when you start to take these little action steps, again, it could be buying yourself Starbucks. It could be booking that manicure, whatever it is, booking the trip to Italy, signing up with the coach, your mind will start to see that it's safe to do that. And that's what we're looking to achieve here because right now your mind is freaking out. It doesn't know how to handle more money, or at least it thinks it doesn't. Maybe that's your story. Maybe you're worried about being bad with money. Maybe you're worried about being judged. If that's the case, we want to start to introduce you to a new way of living. So your mind sees that it's safe and it's not actually a reason to not move forward. It's not a reason to, um, you know, stay, to stay stuck. Okay. So I want you to really think about what that would look like for you. What would be those action steps that you could take starting today that will get you closer? Maybe it's researching the trip right? One of the things that comes up for every group that I train is this issue. Well, not every group, but, but a lot of people in the groups is this issue around things like flying first class. Okay. So I'm curious, does anyone have any issues with that? Does anyone think that, or has anyone been taught that that's greedy or it's a waste of money, right? We all have these beliefs around certain practices or things that people do. I'm seeing some yeses, right? And this is one of the things that I had to work through as well. I didn't fly first class as a child. My parents didn't fly first class. They don't today, even though they're really successful. But I realized it was one of the things I desire. I didn't want to have to go to the back of the plane. I didn't want to want to have to know that I could potentially have to leave my bag you know, when I was entering the plane, I wanted to know that there would be space above my seat. I wanted to be fully taken care of. I wanted to enter the plane first, all these things. And this is just one example. It's a simple example, but you have to start to start to look at the things that you're judging on a regular basis and how they're keeping you broke. So I committed to myself that I would always fly first class or business class. That was a commitment I made eight years ago. What commitments can you start to make to show yourself what's possible? Maybe you go to the lobby of a beautiful hotel. You allow yourself to be in that space. There's so many people that don't even let themselves go to the beautiful places or don't let themselves try on the clothes. This is an issue. If you're holding yourself back from the things that you want, there's some judgment there. There's some questioning there. And that's keeping you from the life that you are craving. Okay. So there's an amazing quote here I want to read really quick. It says, if you are constantly worried about where the money is or where, sorry, if you're constantly worried about where the money that's going to come from, think about the lie you're believing in order for you to be in worry. You're really communicating that you don't have the power to manifest that into your life at will. So you're also communicating that everything else has a power over you. That's huge. Think about the lie you're believing in order to be in worry. You're communicating you don't have the power to manifest that money in your life at will. And you do. The desire is there. So the money is there. Okay. Now, one of the things that I want to make sure you're clear on is some more ways to transform any of the blocks that are coming up for you. Okay. So the first step is really that awareness. You actually recognize that it's there. You don't make yourself wrong for it. You just look at it and be the observer. Remember to have patience and love for yourself throughout this person, this process. Okay. The next thing is to remind yourself what's possible. Now I want to kind of blow your mind a little bit here. Now, this is not a money related example, but it's one of my favorite examples of possibility. So I want everyone in the chat box to guess what the world record is for the amount of consecutive push-ups in one go. Okay, just put in the chat box, what number do you think someone was able to achieve in terms of nonstop pushups? So we have 220, we have 1,000, we have 250, 500, 180. Dr. Stephanie says 4,278. <laughs> Love it. Okay, so none of those are right. The answer is 10,507. Now, this was achieved by an amazing man in Japan in October 1980, breaking the record of 7,650 by another gentleman in 1977 in the U.S. I share that today. 
because we have to remind ourselves on a regular basis what is possible. And the best way to do that is to look at people doing amazing things. Look at people who are making a ton of money. Surround yourself by people who are doing the unthinkable, what your mind believes is the unthinkable right now. Because the sooner you do that, the sooner your mind's going to accept in this new reality that you want to create. If everyone around you is making a million dollars a year, that's going to become pretty normal pretty quickly. But the majority of people are around others who are broke, people who have a negative mindset. I'm sure in this community, there are so many inspiring people. And so you're getting a bit of that. But ask yourself on a regular basis, are you surrounding yourself by wealthy people? Are you surrounding yourself by people who inspire you? Or is your mindset in the gutter? Because all of their mindsets are in the gutter. And one thing I want to say around that is you guys are jumping into this process with me tonight, which is so amazing. Just recognize that as you're starting to transform your mindset, you're more susceptible to what other people think because this is a new way of thinking for you. So you might choose not to talk to certain people about money or about your dreams because they could potentially infiltrate your mindset in a negative way. So just be aware of what's coming up for you as you have conversations in your community, as you have conversations with friends and family, especially over the holiday season, right? So now at this point in my life and after doing this work for eight years, I'm pretty strong. And so people aren't going to permeate my mindset or my belief system because I know what I'm about and what I'm capable of creating. But it wasn't like that in the beginning. I remember there was uh, an evening where I showed my 75 year old grandpa my website. And, you know, this is a man who had never used a computer before. And he looked at it and was so confused and had nothing positive to say. And I was like distraught, <laughs> right? And that's what I'm talking about. So often there are people in our lives who won't get it and that's okay. They're on their own journey, but just make sure you're surrounding yourself by people who do, people who are going to inspire you, okay? The next thing that is the magical elixir to everything you want is gratitude. Now I mentioned in the little phrases that I wrote out for myself, it would always be present moment sentences. So I'm so happy and grateful that I've now hit six figures. I'm so happy and grateful that this new client has signed up with me. I'm so happy and grateful that I got to fly first class. All of that expresses to the mind that it's already happened. And that's what we want to create. We want to create this new normal in your mind, and that will help you actually see it in reality. Now that sounds really crazy to a lot of people, but we have to become the next level version of ourselves and think about that next level and really own it before we see it manifest. At least that's how it worked for me. One of my, and I'm almost done, Dr. Stephanie. One of my favorite examples of this is this beautiful quote from the book, Pussy. Anyone read it by Mama Gina? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So she was redesigning herself, reinventing herself, stepping into this woman, uh, this, this persona of Mama Gina for this incredible community and company that she was building. And what she decided was that she actually needed a painting of herself in her house, as you do. So she went to a store with a friend and bought a dress. She saw this dress. She loved it. The only issue is that this dress was $6,000. Okay. Now, before I read this quote to you, I want you to think for yourself, what would happen if you went to a store and there was a dress that you loved, but it was $6,000. Would you buy it? What would you think? Would you think I can't buy that? My husband will kill me. I don't have enough money. I can't put this on the credit card. Who am I to own that? I would just ruin it. I'm not worthy. What would those thoughts actually be? Now for Mama Gina, her real name's Regina. She had all of those thoughts. So she decided she made this plan that she was going to buy the dress, but she was going to take it back after she sat for the painting. Now, the only issue was that on the first sitting, she had her little like toilet paper stuffed under her armpit so she wouldn't get sweat on the dress. And she was hours into the sitting and realized that the painter had literally only done a portion of her face. So there were going to have to be multiple sittings. So she shared this with her partner at the time. And he said this amazing quote. He said, Regina, you are not taking back the dress. You are going to step into the dress. You were going to buy shoes for the dress, earrings for the dress, hose and gorgeous lingerie. Next time you go for a sitting, you're going to take the car service downtown wearing the dress. You were going to learn how to get in and out of the car in the gown. Let the dress teach you how to be Mama Gina. Let the dress take you and introduce you to what you want to become. 
And that's what this is about. Step into your new normal, figure out what it is that you actually desire and take those action steps towards it. Whenever I talk about money mindset, I recognize that a lot of people are thinking this is going to be about manifesting and literally just the mindset work, but I don't believe we go to the top of a mountain and manifest our way to success. You have to take action. I know Dr. Stephanie talks to you about the fact that no one's going to save you. And that's so true. You have to get out of the mindset of waiting, delaying, focusing on the big dream, but never actually taking action towards it. That's not going to create wealth. So focus on that gratitude, start to flip the switch, but ultimately take action on behalf of the wealth that you want to create. So that's it for me. Thank you. That's incredible. Oh my goodness. I, um, this was supposed to be a podcast episode and I have literally made two pages of notes here. That's amazing. And there's so, there's so much overlap. I mean, first Betty's, um, we've, you know, when, when she started talking about desires, I hope that you were thinking, oh my gosh, there's a desire training inside HBHQ. Maybe I'll go back and look at that. Um, so please go back and check out that desire training. But I loved what you said, um, where, um, no desire is felt until the supply is ready. I mean, you were reading a quote, but this is so incredible. Um, I want to just, um, for a moment, talk a little bit about how we might begin to heal some of these wounds. I mean, you touched on the subconscious, of course, David, uh, is a, just a dear friend of mine. He's also been on the podcast uh, as well. We'll make sure that uh, we put that, um, that podcast episode in the show notes when this is produced, but let's talk a little bit about the subconscious and the unconscious, because you talked a little bit about it through this presentation where writing things in the present are a way to um, begin to reprogram some of those limiting beliefs. And I guess my question to you here is how do we begin to reconcile some of these deep wounds that we may have been exposed to as children? Like I'm not worthy, or, you know, when we're talking specifically about money, I think that we hear like, you know, money is the root of all evil and only the rich people, like there's a lot of othering, like the rich neighbors down the street, those people do that, but we do this, you know, or we don't fly first class, only rich people do that. How do we begin to reconcile some of these limiting beliefs um, and I'll, I'll throw in, um, you know, maybe even wounds. Like I think there's, there's trauma around this as well. Like fear, you know, you said, if I, um, you know, if I make more money then people are going to le- they're going to expect me to pay or they're going to, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to, I'm not going to fit in anymore because I'm not going to fit in with my family anymore. This sort of core wound of a fear of abandonment. How do we begin to reconcile that, um, to present day behavior? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, one of the biggest things was that awareness piece and not judging myself for it. And also being able to say, you know what, this is not my material. This is my mom's material, or this is my grandma's material. And that's not actually my belief system. And like I said, I started um, with small things because I started to kind of verify to my mind that that wasn't the truth. And it didn't happen overnight. It was small steps in the direction of what I wanted. And looking back, that um, that process of just shifting into living as if, and allowing myself to go and try on the clothes or be in the hotel and, you know, not even spending any money, but just being in that space. That was me starting to retrain my mind to believe that it was safe and it was possible for me, even if other people taught me differently. And, you know, the desire piece was everything. When I realized that my desires were dropped in, they were like DNA. Then I realized I could trust that. I didn't have to feel separate from my desires or scared of them. They were a part of me and I could be, um, I could move towards them without fear. Amazing. And when it comes to um, our desires, I think uh, you said something that I've said before inside this community. And I said something like, you know, all the desires that you have are meant for you. You know, like you, you know, I don't have the dream of being a soccer player or, you know, in the NBA because that's not my destiny. I'm not meant to do that. But I do dream about having a huge community inside Hello Betty. And I do dream about, 
going to big stages and speaking to women and, you know, changing the narrative around female health and physiology and how we are, how we should be empowering ourselves and recognizing that we are maybe different uh, than our male counterparts in the most beautiful of ways, right? Um, what are what are some of the consequences um, if, you, if you continue to reject yourself, uh, you continue to reject those desires, what are some of the consequences of not expressing yourself or acting on those desires? What happens to that internal GPS? You know, I think we all have this uh, intuition or this innate uh, voice that speaks to us when we quiet the mind a little bit enough to hear it. What is it? What, what have you seen this with your clients? Um, people who repress these desires long enough, like what happens, you know, what, what, what is the consequence of that? What happens to our inner in knowing our inner intuition? Yeah, I think it, we no longer trust it. And I know for me, when I was going through this process in the beginning, and when I turned the car around and went back to Ohio, that was one of the first big moments of listening to my intuition. And once I did that and I saw, oh, okay, that did actually work out. There was a reason that I was feeling this way. And I'm glad that I trusted it. Then I was able to do it more and more and able to do it faster. But when we suppress it, I mean, ultimately we're not living our best life. We're not living in, a, in alignment. And this could mean that we have diseases. It could mean that we have low energy. It could mean that we choose bad relationships because we don't know how to develop trust with ourselves. And that's actually, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, but there's an amazing book by Ian LeVan Zant called Trust. And it had, talks about four different types of trust. And that was definitely huge for me. And I think a lot of women don't trust themselves and they've been taught to deny what it is that they actually want or disregard it, or it doesn't matter, or it's not possible. And so it's easier to suppress it. But when that happens, I mean, ultimately we're not living our best life and it can lead to a whole slew, you know, tons of problems, which I'm sure you know more about from a health perspective than I do. Um, but for me, it was ultimately um, when I when I stopped um, allowing myself to be scared of my desires, that's when everything opened up for me. Otherwise, I would have been on that path that I thought I should be on going to graduate school, you know, doing the thing that I was supposed to do. But I wasn't happy. And I don't know. There's no point of, of you know, going through life, not being happy or waiting to be happy. And I think that that's I, I think that there's something innately uh, common to many females listening to that. I think that when we, when we did our desire training in Hello Betty, there was a lot of fear around what, if I let it in, isn't the other shoe going to drop? Like if I let something good in, if I, if I stop resisting and I let something in, isn't something bad going to happen? Isn't that the yin and yang, the order and the chaos of life? Yeah. I mean, it, makes me so sad to think that that's how so many people are living their lives, but that's what we've been taught to always be on the lookout for something bad to happen and always have our guard up. And, you know, there's so much programming from, even from just speaking for myself, from my mom and my grandma all around not being safe, especially as a woman. And I think we, we take that to the extreme and we always think if something good has happened, well, when is it going to change? Is this too good to be true? Is this all going to crumble? And I see this with entrepreneurs all the time. They've built something successful. And then on the, you know, on the flip side, they're thinking, is this going to crumble? Is this going to last? Or did I just get lucky? Right. So we have to strengthen our worthiness muscles. And I know for me, like we talked about core wounds a little bit, mine is always not good enough. So my mind is always looking for verification that I'm not good enough. But now that I have this information, I can be on high alert and have awareness around this. So when I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see a post that makes me feel not good enough, I know that's not actually truth. And I can come back to my practices around that help me fill myself back up. How many of you feel not good enough? That, I mean, that is one of my core wounds too. I mean, I think, I think that is almost a universal, not good enough fear of abandonment uh, is another one, like extreme fear around that. Um, and one of the things that um, I've spoken to David about, um, we spoke a little bit about this when he was on the, on the show was that the universe is always as wishy as like, you know, we're going to woo out here. It's like, as the universe is always trying to get you to turn around into your greatness, like everybody here and everybody who ends up listening to this as a podcast episode, 
we are all incre- we are all great. This is something that Giovanni and I talk about all the time that there is an in- inherent and innate greatness in every single person. And we're so afraid to make the mistakes. Like you said, you know, you have these big goals and they're so far away. And I was like, oh damn, she's talking to me because I talk about, I'm like, I'm going to have a villa in Italy one day. But if you ask me where in Italy, I couldn't tell you where, I couldn't tell you exactly how, you know. So I think that um, being uh, being um, willing to make mistakes as you're, you know, it's like fail, I think there's like fail fast forward or fail forward fast, something like that, you know, where you're willing to make mistakes and look at them as a teaching tool. Like this is that F word failure is like far worse than any other F word I could ever come up with. Like people are petrified of failure. How do you, how do you help reframe failure for your clients? And how did you do that for yourself? I think it came from me experiencing my own failure and realizing that no one died and everything was okay. (laughs) And I think so often we have to follow our fear. So for me, one of my biggest fears was bankruptcy because my dad and my grandpa both experienced that as entrepreneurs. And so I had this big fear around failing and losing everything. But then when I followed the fear, I realized that the worst thing that would happen would be that I would have to start over. But I would probably do it faster because I'd already built a business before. I have more connections. And so when I started to follow that and play the card, you know, play the tape through, so to speak, I realized it didn't have power over me in the same way that I thought. So I think it's so important that you follow the failure and ask yourself, okay, if the worst case scenario happened, what would be the reality? And, you know, nine times out of 10, no one dies and you literally just start over or you ask somebody for help and that's the extent of the the problem. And so when I look at it like that, you know, it is kind of laughable because we're spending so much time and energy worrying about these things that most likely won't happen. And if they do happen, they're amazing lessons because then you know what not to do. And I take all of my lessons and teach them to my clients because I feel like sometimes, and I'm sure you resonate with this, Sometimes I go first and then I can tell them what not to do, or I can help them avoid. <laughs> Let me shorten the learning curve for you. Don't do this. Yes. yes. So yes, it's yes. all good and yeah. everyone wins. And yeah. so, yeah, that would be, and I know for me, like my greatest challenges have been teachers and have been the things that have helped me pivot in the right direction or grow stronger. And I really believe that challenges are literally prepping us for something. Like when when we think about it like that, it's like, it's like lifting weights. You're being made stronger. The stress is, is breaking down your muscles to rebuild them. And it's the same thing with challenges. And it took me a long time to get there because I'm not naturally like, yay challenges. But because of what I've experienced over the last eight years, I feel like I have a different relationship. And so if people, you know, can listen to that and start to um, get on the challenge train sooner, it will make a world of difference. Yeah. It's, it's resistance training is training your resistance. It's one, actually, it's one of the tools for, I think, a successful mind. And it's, it's funny. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, a dinner I had with David when I last, the last I saw him, we went for dinner together. He had flown me down to go, you know, to be a guest on his show. And afterwards we went for dinner and I, we got into this idea of imposter syndrome. So I see Brittany in the chat says, it feels like an imposter at times. And me, one of my, one of my core wounds, if you will, is like at any, at some point, someone's going to be like, oh my God, she actually knows nothing. She, you know, she's, she's actually a fool. And like, can we all leave her right now? So it's like two wounds, you know, it's like fear of abandonment and everyone's going to find out that I'm actually a bumbling idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. And so David was like, okay, what if that's true? What, what if that's true? Let's just like follow it all the way down to the end. What if you are actually an idiot? <laughs> right, like, and what did you discover? I was like, well, okay, maybe I, maybe I am. If I am totally an idiot, I've still done some good in the world. Like I've still helped some women, like some women have benefited from it. He's like, okay, so does it matter if you're the smartest person in the world or you're like a bumbling idiot? It makes no difference. And he's like, and what happens if, you know, they all quit your membership and like, they know, you know, like, and then what? And I was like, oh my God, this is such a hard question, you know? But at the end of the day, it's just like you were saying, like you would find, you'd say, you say, okay, this is how I got it wrong. And this is, these are the changes that I would make in the future. So you sort of, you, you sort of look at the big pink elephant in the room and you're like, okay, I'll acknowledge that you're here. Maybe I am not the smartest person. Maybe I am, you know, maybe all those things that I, that I'm scared about my job, maybe there's some truth to them. 
or maybe it's, you know, your mind, your sub, that subconscious, you know, narrative, just trying to keep you safe so that you don't continue to move in the direction that you actually want to. So, um, I wanted to, I just wanted to share that with you because I remember at dinner and I started crying and I was like, well, now I'm like exhausted because I've been crying. I can't have my steak. And he's like, well, that's actually the subconscious. Like when you get so, um, uh, when you are so overwhelmed by a, by a, by a concept, one of the mechanisms that your subconscious mind does is it tries to shut it down. Right. It's like, you get really tired. You can't focus anymore. And I was like, oh damn, like, you know, you, you sort of learn about these things and you, you sometimes take one or two degrees of separation. Like I'm going to learn about the subconscious, but I don't have a subconscious, you know, like I'm going to learn about the unconscious, but that isn't my problem. And then, you know, when it starts happening to you, you're like, Oh frick, man, I am, I am part of the human race. Like this is, (laughs) I love that example, but it like, if you can just be aware in the way that you're describing of what's going on, then there's no power. It doesn't have the power over you anymore. It's you're aware of what's happening and the way that the mind's trying to hold you back. And I really think that awareness is such a superpower and one of the keys to success because we're always going to have fear. There's always going to be challenge. There's always going to be a next level. But if we can understand what the mind is doing and know that it's not truth, then it doesn't have power over us.